Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa DeSisto. I'm the publisher of the Portland Press Herald, Main Sunday Telegram. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight for the second in our Main Voices Live series, another sellout tonight, and a special welcome to all the Press Herald subscribers. And everyone else, eh, hello. <laughs> so we have a great uh, program tonight. We are delighted to bring um, poet Richard Blanco to the stage. And tonight he will be interviewed by Press Herald arts writer Bob Keats. I think Bob, an award-winning writer, has been with the Press Herald since, I think, 2002. And I think he has one of the best beats in the state because every week he gets to tell the story of the musicians, poets, painters, actors that make up the amazing arts community that we have here um, in Maine. So we're delighted that Bob will be our interviewee, interviewer tonight. Um, I would like to thank our uh, sponsors, the Press Hotel and also Hub Furniture, who outfitted our stage um, tonight. So if you like that chair, you can go down and get one. <laughs> and uh, I would also like to welcome our newest sponsor, H.M. Payson, who's uh, a sponsor for the whole series. For more than 160 years, which is actually even longer than the Press Herald, H.M. Um, Payson has been supporting the innovative work that's done here in our community. And they love to partner for events like this to, for, so they can celebrate the community and also their clients who rely on them for sound investment, advice, and trust services. So again, thank you to H.M. Payson. Following tonight's talk, we will have a book signing right here on the stage with Mr. Blanco, and um, Longfellow Books will have his works for sale. If you don't have them already, I do see some people with them. That's okay. Um, so, poet Richard Blanco, a Cuban-American, read a poem at the reopening of the U.S. Embassy in Havana, Cuba, last August. So, the, the timeliness of him being here tonight with everything that's been in the news about Cuban-American relations is, could, couldn't have been more perfect. Um, last year, he released a memoir, The Prince of Los Focios, A Miami Childhood. So from Miami to Bethel, Maine, I, we want to hear about that uh, adventure. And um, in 2013, he wrote and deliver, delivered the poem, One Today, for President Obama's second inauguration. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, America, One Today. One sun rose on us today, kindled over our shores, peeking over the Smokies, greeting the faces of the Great Lakes, spreading a simple truth across the Great Plains, then charging across the Rockies. One light waking up rooftops, under each one a story told by our silent gestures moving across windows. My face, your face, millions of faces in morning's mirrors, each one yawning to life, crescendoing into our day. The pencil yellow school buses, the rhythm of traffic lights, fruit stands, apples, limes, and oranges arrayed like rainbows, begging our praise. Please welcome to the stage, Bob Keith. I hear the applause right away. And I was literally thinking, don't quit your day job, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as you turn around, you hear the roar and then the standing ovation and the, of, the, of the whole assembly. And, and so that was like, okay, okay all right. Let's see what happens. I, I think you did okay. Then it started really sinking. And I was like, okay, I did mess up. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's okay. <laughs> did you introduce your mom to the president? No, no. In that, in those occasions, you know, I thought it was. I thought there was going to be a sort of a lot more uh, sort of elbow rubbing with the president stuff, but not really. And and, and I was concerned about introducing my mom because uh, my mom uh, is very scared of speaking English. She knows English, but she's very scared about it. And when I invited her to be the person sitting next to me, um, I was concerned about that. And I said, you know, if the president comes up to you, I mean, I've never been to inauguration, so I don't know what the <laughs> protocol is. You can't be nervous and you can't start saying, you know, you can't start talking in Spanish. You gotta like, you know, <laughs> you gotta be on your best behavior. And she said, well, 
I'll go if you want me to. It's <laughs> a typical mom answer, right? So, but no, uh, I, they didn't get to meet, actually. That's good. I never realized that they never did get to meet him personally. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you told me that you spoke with the president only briefly that day, but did you have maintained a relationship with him since then? Are you a friend of the president's? Well, um, yeah, I can't quite you know, <laughs> call him and ask him to lunch kind of thing. Um, uh, what was, again, getting back to that, you know, I thought, when you hear inaugural ball, in my head, I, I had thought ball, I mean, what do I know about inauguration? I thought it was a ball like Cinderella ball or something, you know, like I uh, even brought a book on from Brooks Brothers, A Gentleman at the Table, and I thought I'd be <laughs> dancing salsa with Michelle and having, you know, <laughs> having a martini with the president and asking what, it, what he thought about my poem and whatnot. But of course, anybody at the inauguration, it's really nothing like that. But ever since then, I'm lucky to guess. So in a way, that was anticlimactic mm -hmm. after that. But in a way, uh, but after that, I'm happy to report, they have called on me on several occasions here and there for different kinds of, the First Lady and the President separately, some, some, sometimes things to do with the arts, sometimes to do with LGBT groups. So we've maintained a relationship, so I try to write them every once in a while, send them the book, whatever, whatever I'm working on that sort of supports his presidency. So we're in communication, not completely directly, but, but uh, sort of, yeah, I think we, we have a, a, a kind of a relationship of mutual sort of respect for each other in a way. He spoke with you just before he went to Cuba? Yes, that sounds so romantic. <laughs> and I, just love, I just love dropping that at dinner. Um, I just had dinner with the president last week. Um, um, it, it has to do with something else that if I tell you, I have to kill you all. Um, but, um, but it was very informal, and I was surprised because he offered some comment very informally and very casually uh, and, and very naturally as he is. Mm -hmm. um, and it was right before the trip to Cuba. And of course, I had my hesitations because, of course, I'm, I don't, you know, I, I don't have, again, direct access. So I wasn't, we were all sort of, sort of circling around as a Cuban American community, wondering what, what was going on and what. And he offered some very candid but very informal remarks, and it felt, made me really understand his intentions were really sort of going to really key in sort of really positively with the Cuban American community. I felt really good about that. Um, what, surprisingly, and, and, I, and this came through in part of his speech, a lot of it had to do with his concern for the youth. Mm -hmm. He has, what I've noticed lately, is that he has this connection to youth, you know, the future of the youth, and I think, um, and he was mostly commenting about that, that his interest in making sure that the youth of Cuba have, have the opportunities, as he said in his speech, have opportunities and, and a brighter future um, for themselves. What has the reaction of the Cuban American community been in the days since? Well, I mean, I don't live in Miami now, so it's kind of, my mother is, my mother's everything, but my <laughs> she's like the, She's, she's my, my, my source, yes. so to speak. Um, and so my mother and I have obviously very candid conversations about all this kinds of stuff. But um, I think there were a lot of naysayers, there were a lot of people that were apprehensive. And, but slowly, you know, step by step, people got more used to things and said, well, maybe, well, maybe, well, let's see what happens and whatnot. And my mother recently reported, much to my surprise, and I think to her own, that the, the speech that he delivered at, at to the Cuban people, the one that was televised. I mean, it was just knockout, <laughs> right? And my mother has been saying that people, I mean, word of mouth, again, there's always the naysayers mm -hmm. that will never admit to anything. He says even the, some, you know, many of the naysayers um, were even impressed because he mentioned, he, he made a lot of great points that we all wanted to hear, you know, this idea. And I thought it was brilliant. I mean, seriously, this idea that that the, this Cold War is over. We're not here to change you. So you don't have to, he disarmed the Cuban government by saying, we're not here to change you and take over. And like, you know, like this is in 1950, whatever. We're just saying, this is who we stand as a nation, <coughs> right? These, these are all values. And we have relationships with people that don't share the same values, but we're not gonna give up those values. We want to sort of, we want to understand each other. And, but our hope is that, that there will be that change. 